Good evening and welcome to Sand Hills Biker Church. Woo! <laughs> I'd like to open up in prayer before we praise and worship all the same. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this building we're in, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Lord, we just we ask now that your Holy Spirit would still this place, Lord. Fill our instruments, our hearts, let it come out of our mouths as we sing, Lord. And uh, we pray that the hearts are open for uh, Slow Lord's message tonight, Lord. And it reaches all those that need to be reached, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.
come before you, Lord, tonight, and we give you all glory and honor and praise. And I thank you so much for that old rugged cross, Lord God, that, that Jesus was slain for our sins so that we could spend eternity in the presence of him in, in heaven, Lord God. And I just thank you for that, Lord God. And Lord God, I ask that you open our hearts and our minds to, to the message that you have laid on Pat's heart tonight, Lord. And I just I pray that we overflow with it, Lord, so that we can share it with those that we come in contact with, Lord, whether it's in our home, in our community, where we work, Lord God, wherever it is that you have us to share. And Lord God, let us let people know that when they see us, that you're in us, Lord God. Don't let anybody doubt that we are for you and that you are in us and that we we are here to bring your kingdom, bring more to your kingdom, Lord God. And I love you and I praise you. As your son, Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How are we on volume? Good. 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 I am lucky to be here and alive tonight. Mm-hmm. And I know everybody, hey amen. I want you know, I'm happy and lucky to be alive too, but you don't know understand. I mean, specifically tonight. I was, uh, somebody brought me flowers. Oh, those are my oh, <laughs> Thanks. I figured it's one of your youngins. is out there picking weeds and building little <laughs> rock statues. <laughs> but, um, no, I was digging around in the sewing kit. Now, we got these little bitty scissors to have razor sharp, and they got needle point tips on them. I mean, sharp points. But I was thinking they were the right length to, to trim the old stash. The problem is, some of you know I've got a bit of a trimmer. <laughs> yeah, right? You know where it's going. I got this thing lined up just right, just, and it got, and I twitched, and I stuck it right up in my nose hole. Oh. And, uh, yeah, see, it, I've seen people die on TV doing that, you know, getting something crammed in their nose hole, other than your finger. I mean, God made it to, for that, but not pointy objects. And uh, it took a small team of doctors to get the bleeding to stop. But, uh, so, what? I'm just praising the Lord, man. He brought me through that. You know, we go through trials in our lives. It was, it was an incident. And well, I want to, look, I thought I'd come to you and share my problems and, and you get pray for it. Oh, you're laughing at me. It's not nice. Out of love. Out of love. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm the idiot to went and shove scissors in my nose hole. Hey, we got you're a school teacher with little kids, right? You know those scissors with the little bull nose? The safety scissors? Could you help me help a pair of those? <laughs> so, <laughs> something I can trim with without trying to kill myself. Like, that's what I need. I need some little kindergarten scissors. Yeah. Without cutting themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and they keep it out of their nose hole. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's one of the first rules we teach them. <laughs> first rule we teach them. Don't stick scissors in your nose hole. Don't run with them and don't stick them up your nose hole. All right. Hey, um, we're going to be in uh, Joshua 5, but at the very end of it. So find Joshua 6 and then just go a few paragraphs back. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I like starting out back in y'all's evening. Got my stupid. <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, self-deprivation is a uh, is is a uh, is a defense against other people picking on you. Because if you just pick on yourself first, you can't take away their ammo. So that's really why I do it. It's my insecurity, really. That's what I know. <laughs> Yeah, man. Hey, we're going to talk about the place, the physical place of the church. And you know, over the past, what, month or so, we've been talking about uh, people in the church, different ministries in the church, women serving in ministries, men appointed and ordained in, in positions. We've talked, everything is focused on the body of Christ, which is good. That's where we should focus is on the body of Christ. But... If, in that, if we focus so much on the body of Christ, sometimes we can minimize the, the benefits of the physical place of church. It's at a point where some people actually have minimized it to the point where they say it's unnecessary or unbiblical to have a church place. Now, I understand the, the argument 
where if you're spending so much of, of your your resources, excuse me, <coughs> if you're spending so much of your resources on church building projects that you're not spending those resources on ministry, outreach ministries, for example, or giving to missionaries and things, then then your your priorities are probably off. But to swing the pendulum too far in the other direction and to say that there's no value in a physical place of church is that's not biblical either. And what I want to look at is if we go to, say we're in Joshua 5, I'm going to start, start at verse 5, Joshua 5, 5. And we're going to look at tonight the benefits of the physical place of church. And what I want you to understand is this place could be in your home. It could be in a garage. It could be, and we've done church in, in bar parking lots. The physical place of a church the things that we're going to go through tonight aren't saying it has to be a designated church building, big steeple, and a bunch of money thrown at it. But it, there is a benefit to having a set place that's a physical place of church. So let's look at why. In verse 5, now all the people that came out were circumcised. Wait, let me give you the, the context. You know, I've jumped further back. Um, this is where the Israelites had been in the wilderness and wandering. They just crossed the Jordan. And all of the, um, everything that's happened here is happening in the encampment on the other side of the Jordan. So that's where we're at. We, Joshua it just had, took his people and he's crossed the Jordan near, the, uh, near Jericho. So now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness, till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Now when it says consumed, realize these were the people that were told, because you didn't obey the voice of the Lord, they were told, you won't see the promised land. So all of this time and wandering, families are continuing, children are being born, but when they finally cross the Jordan, nobody is left that was from the original people. That's the, the generations that had to pass until every person that came out of Egypt consumed, had died, had passed. So it's the next generation. Well, those that were born in the wilderness... They hadn't been circumcised yet. They, they were a part of that covenant, but they didn't do that in the way as they were traveling. So in verse 7, we see, And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. So as they were traveling. In verse 9, we see, This day, and the Lord said unto Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you, Wherefore, the name of this place is called, it's, it's um, G-I-L-G-A-L, the Gilgal, but it's pronounced, it's pronounced Gagal. Unto this day, when, and that Gagal means um, rolled away. And the children of Israel encamped in Gagal and kept the Passover. On the fourteenth day of the month, at even the plains of Jericho. I'm going, to, I'm going to jump down. I'm going to read the whole passage. But if you look at verse 12, you see that manna ceased. And verse 13, you see where Joshua meets the Lord of hosts, which is Jesus, appearing with a sword. Joshua falls on his face to the earth and worships. And he's told, Loose thy shoe from thy foot, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Now, the reason I jumped around a bit is because if you can go back in and dig through this passage. But... I want to get into some, some things. Again, the meaning of this rolled away, where God rolled away the reproach of Egypt of the of their captivity in Egypt. The reproach or the, the disgrace of captivity. That was rolled away. And each one of these, I'm gonna we're gonna look at what happened in, in this place and then jump over and look at the application to where we're at today. So in this you have the, the circumcision's taken place. That's a renewed relationship. You see, where the people that had not obeyed the Word of God, then those that did, there was a renewed relationship. They went back to their the founding principles. 
there's a renewed relationship, and then in verse 9, there's a new beginning where God rolled back that reproach. And then they find themselves in a place, the place where they're at is named after this rolling back of the reproach, rolling back of the world. So, what we're looking at is the influence of the world being rolled away. This is a place of spiritual maturity. When you look in verse 12 where the manna ceased. When the manna, up until then, where people were given manna, they didn't have to do much for themselves. When the manna ceased, now they have to start to feed themselves and provide for themselves. Jump forward to where we're at. We have the total body of Scripture. We don't have prophets coming to us anymore and telling us what God says. We have to go in and find the food for ourselves. We do our studies, right? We come out and we, we hear preaching and we have these meetings where we get together and we're having to feed ourselves from what God's provided. We're not being spoon-fed anymore. So the manna ceased. And then you see where we're on holy ground. God rolled away the reproach. Let me give you some things that happened at um, Galgal. Gal -Gal. God rolled away the reproach. Gibeon, uh, Gibeonites met with Joshua and made a treaty with the Israelites there. Saul was made king and became the first king to rule over Israel. The people of Judah met King David at Golgal to bring him over the Jordan River after Absalom died. So what's this have to do with the place of the church? Why does the church matter? The church, this was a place where the, the world's influence had been rolled away. It was a, a place of renewed relationships. It was a place of, of new beginnings. It was a place of accommodation, where, where individuals, a place of preparation. The sacraments were done. They, they did the circumcision. They did Passover at this place. And, and the church, it's a place where we do the Lord's Supper, baptisms, weddings. A place of accommodation and promotion, where, the, where David was, was made king. In the church, we talk about where people are recognized for their calling and their appointments and their ordinations. Within the organization, we do promotions. It's a refuge. Jesus said, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. This place of Gugal was a place for people to prepare for what God had next for them. And it wasn't a place where they just passed through. When they got to the other side of the Jordan, what, was the, what's, what do we all know about Jericho? What happened to Jericho that was significant? Right, everybody knows the song from Junior Church where they fought the Battle of Jericho. But that what we've talked, that wasn't the only battle that was fought. There was an entire campaign, a military campaign, that happened throughout that region following that first battle at Jericho. Where was their base camp? Oh, gal. That was the base camp. That was the place of preparation. It was the place of consecration. It was the place where they would come and refresh. When we take away the physical place of the church, we spend our time on the missions field. Where do we come in and clean off our boots? I know in uh, areas that are agrarian, farming regions, a lot of times you have what's called a mud porch. You know what the mud porch is? You go outside and get all nasty, you come in, that's where you take off your, your muddy boots and clothes and stuff before you enter the main house. When you come through those doors, let that threshold be a mud porch. That's where you take off all the mud of the world that you've been dealing with all week or should be dealing with all week. If you're not dealing with the mud of the world, you may want to check what you're doing in your, in your Christian walk. But if you're out getting your boots muddy, you're out being exposed to the world, we have a place where God has rolled away the reproach of the world 
so that we have a refuge where we can come and prepare. It's a place where people get, get saved and come to Christ. It's a place where people get baptized, that, that renewal, renewed relationship. It's a place where every major decision in my life as a Christian, rather it be coming to Christ, answering a call to preach, entering into a specific missions field, those decisions happened more often than not in a place of worship, a refuge, a sanctuary where I could come forward. There's a place where we can sing and enter. You know, this isn't a concert. It's not just a band. The music is so that we can enter into a place of worship. What music does is it allows us to take all of the, the field work and start to block that out and sing about that old rugged cross and, and, and take our mind and transition to a place where for once a week we're focused on God and His Holy Spirit working in our lives. And by the end of that worship, if you're fully engaged, your spirit should be ready to then sit through 30 or 40 minutes of me babbling. That takes some really good singing to get you to that point. It needs some good prep work. But think of the, the sanctuary we have when we do that. People say, well, you know, I can do church with my tree stand out hunting. You can talk to God out there, but you can't do church. You don't have this sanctuary, this rolled away protected place. You know, the devil has no place here. Isn't the Holy Spirit stronger than the devil? So if you get a room full of people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, and we start out praising and worship and entering into prayer, and we ask the Holy Spirit to run freely amongst us, the Holy Spirit owns this space. It's this physical encampment. Do you think this base camp was well protected? Sure it was. Because this is the place where their families lived. This is the place where they came back and did their refit. This is the place where they brought back their wounded. It's the place where they brought back and dealt with their dead. It's a place where they sharpened their swords. They prepared their kit to go out on the next mission. This base camp was well guarded because that's the one place that the enemy would want to attack. Because if you can take out the base camp... You can cease all forward operations. Military guys, is that true? If I can take out the base camp, I can cease the effectiveness of all forward operations. Now, home. Speaking of forward operations, I've been downrange long enough that we've been out doing a mission, and at the end of the mission, somebody says, it's about time to go home. They didn't mean the home North Carolina. They meant get back to the base camp. Sadly enough, that becomes your home temporarily. It's a temporary home. Carlos and Don just said, you go out and do a mission, you come back, you go to your temporary home, looking forward to a time that you can be at your permanent home with your permanent family. This is our base camp. The world is where we do our operations. But this is not our permanent home, is it? Your permanent home is heaven. Your missions field is out in the world. What is the value of the physical church? It's your base camp. It's your temporary home where you get together with a body of believers. Now, we all have a house that we call our home. Um, another thing that the church serves a benefit is outreach ministry should be outreach, not inreach. Your home is your family's refuge. The devil should have no place in your home either. That comes through prayer. That comes through praying that hedge of protection around your physical house. But what, something that a church does is it allows us to bring the lost world into our base camp because the base camp is so heavily guarded that it's a protected environment for us to then work with that person and allow the Holy Spirit to work in their lives in a safe environment. Where you don't want to bring them in, maybe into your personal home. Because we've run into some of that. Where we've had people into our personal home and we end up having, having some problems. Your personal home is your family's refuge. 
The benefit of having a physical base camp like this is it's well guarded, it's well equipped, and we can bring in folks from the outside. If I want to have a sit down with some folks when I'm downrange, I'm going to bring them out of their environment and bring them into my protected guarded environment and have a sit down with them. That way I know it's just me talking to them and there's no, I don't have all that outside influence. If you want to talk to somebody and have an opportunity to win them to Christ, you can plant seeds out on the missions field. But if you really want to break those strongholds, get them into God's church. Get them into the house of the church, the physical place of the church that's surrounded and filled with God's people and the Holy Spirit. And watch those strongholds start to break down. My kids were invited to church through a bus ministry in Germany. To me, it was a good deal. I could drink on Saturday night, sleep it off on Sunday morning, and some strangers took my kids to church. They babysat them. <laughs> I, was, I was lost as a belly goat in the ocean, man. I, mean, I really was. I, I thought I was okay with it. But eventually, I was. My, my wife convinced me to go to this church. She said, we need to go see what... And, so my wife will set a trap for you. If she's got Jesus and you don't, she'll set a trap for you. I don't know. She may have been talking to preach. But she, she knew how to work with me. She said, we should probably go to that church and see what our kids are being taught. So me, I'm like, yeah. We need to go find out what kind of garbage you're putting in my kids' heads, you know. And, uh, you know, like she kind of got on that side of me. You know, we need to go make sure our kids aren't learning a bunch of weird stuff. So I went. And my goal was to go there and point out all the reasons we don't go to church. God had another plan. Because preacher got up there and opened up the Bible and started talking about stuff that I kind of had going on in my life. And then he started saying bad stuff about me. But he was just reading the Word. But, um, yeah. but see, all the people in my life that were talking to me outside of church were planting seeds. But the devil had such a stronghold on me that I just, just couldn't break through until I got into church. And all of these people in there were praying for me. The preachers prayed. Songs of worship. The devil's gone. He has no hope. Now that's just me and God. Me and my sinful self and God. Not me, my sinful self, and Satan. And when it was just me and God, God's going to win that fight every day. Saul, Saul, why, do you, why are you persecuting me? Why are you kicking against the, the pricks? Right? What was Paul's response? No. He fell down on his face in fear and worshipped. And he didn't even believe in Jesus. So when it was just me and God, my heart started to break. So the next Sunday, I said, yeah, I'm not sure I saw quite enough. Maybe we need to go back. Maybe we need to go back. And eventually, I gave up and surrendered. Came to Christ. And I knew I came to Christ because I was reading a Bible that uh, my, my wife and kids had given me. And I'm in one recliner, she's in another. And I was, I was reading. I started turning pages faster and faster. I was reading in the book of John. I got up to, the, to Calvary. And I was reading all, and, and, and tears start running down my face. And she looks over and says, are you all right? I said, yeah, just give me a minute. You ready? And I finished the story and I closed, closed the book. And, um, and I said, I, I was reading... The, the account of Calvary and the crucifixion. She said, well, you've read that story before. You know that story. Said, yeah, but I've never read it where that was done for me. Hmm. It was the first time. That's how I knew the difference between having a head knowledge of Jesus Christ and a heart knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because the head knowledge said, I've heard the stories. The heart knowledge, I heard the stories and it was done for me. And I couldn't help but cry. And I don't want to ever lose that. But I don't want to ever... It bothers me sometimes when we try to devalue the place, the physical place of church. And again, it can be a home. But is that where you and a congregation of believers... I don't 
don't care five or six families. But are you regularly getting together where you're purposeful and you're setting apart time for God? Are you purposeful and planning what you're going to do when you come before the Lord? Have you planned out your worship? Have you planned out your message? Because if you're not planning, how much respect are you really giving God? If you're getting together for a dinner party at your house and calling it church because somebody reads a couple of verses, that ain't church. I mean, you can call it church, but do you think that really honors God? When you pay more attention to your job or your hobbies than you do dedicating, preparing for church? And that's not just people in ministry. If you're showing up for church, Eat before you get here. Don't sit out there, you know, thinking about the empty stomach you have. Come well rested. Prepare for going to church like you would prepare for going to a meeting with your job or going to a class with your school. Show up ready to receive what God has for you. Take your dirty boots off on the mud porch. Come into the house of worship. And enjoy the fact that we have a renewed relationship, a new beginning, and a place that we can call our base camp, our church. Church isn't a bad word, folks. And when I, when I read this, that's all I could think about was the, the, how important the base camp is. And what this really is to us. It's our base camp. And um, a lot of good stuff happens here. And we need to protect that. We protect it through prayer, having the right spirit, having a regenerate church body and service. Anybody, anybody is welcome to walk through those doors and sit in these seats. But I don't care if it's the ministry of preaching or the ministry of door greeting or ministry of nursery worker. If you're not, if you don't have a testimony of a born again Christian, been baptized and are dedicated to the ministry of that body of believers, you don't need to be in a place of service. There are churches that will bring in people to serve that are unsaved just to have workers. If you've outgrown your saved congregation, you're growing in the wrong direction, my friends. Right? The body of believers... Everybody, that's why, that's why we ask questions when, we, you know, when somebody joins a church. You know, it's not a membership role and then, you know, well, you're out bad, you can't join any other church. You know, it's a, it ain't a club, man. But, but why, do, why do churches have roles and memberships? What you're really doing is you're, you're, you're protecting your, your body to make sure that those wolves that are among us, that we were told there's wolves that are among us, wolves in sheep's clothing, that's why you have to have shepherds and you have to have the sheepdogs. It, it, I mean, if somebody's just flat out out of line, you ought to have a deacon in that church. You know, a deacon is just a servant in the church, right? There ought to be a deacon that's willing to come alongside somebody and escort your butt out the door. And you go out and explain to them in the parking lot why this is our base camp and we're not going to allow that garbage in here. If somebody stands up and starts arguing non-biblical, non-doctrinal stuff in the middle of the sermon, we'll talk to you fine. But you're not going to take... God is a God of order. We're not going to allow you to stand up and cause disorder and focus on yourself. You're going to be politely escorted out the door. That's not very Christian-like. Yeah, it is. It is Christian-like. Because we're supposed to protect what is His. We're supposed to be good stewards of what is His. Right? And we're only supposed to teach one gospel. There's only one message that we teach. So those are all the things that, that we look out for. So that's what I had, was that it's a place of spiritual maturity where the man is ceased, a place of preparation where you put things in order, a place of separation where we separate ourselves from the world, a place of commendation where people are recognized, raised up, and placed into service. And lastly, a place of refuge where we can come and take a break from the world and grow our family strength together. That's a nice message.
Praise God. Uh, dear Lord, uh, I just want to pray that that your light reaches everyone out there, all the, the lost ones, that you bring them to your base camp, your place of, of light, and, and guide all of us to you, Lord. And I pray that, that you keep us all safe as we go out into the physical world and, and bring us back to you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. That's kind of like prayer roulette, man. I, you know what I do this week. I just, you. <laughs> These guys like got prayers in their pocket just in case. 